Millie Galloway, Assignment 2.2. In this assignment, we did an experiment. We predicted for this experiment what heart rate, breathing rate, and energy systems did during steady state exercise. We conducted an experiment which required 20 minutes of exercise on an exercise bike. We then tested to see how their body reacted. This is testing to see how the body reacts to steady state exercise. Steady state exercise is a balance between the energy required by the working muscles and the rate of oxygen circulating the body to get to the muscles. There are three types of hypothesis. There's the null hypothesis. This hypothesis is the average, for example, a 50-50 coin flip. There's the two-tailed hypothesis. The two-tailed hypothesis, or non-directional hypothesis, predicts an open outcome, thus the results can go in two directions. And then there's a one-tailed hypothesis. A one-tailed hypothesis, or directional hypothesis, predicts the actual direction in which the findings will go. Energy systems during steady state exercise. During exercise, the production of adenosine triphosphate will rise because the ATP is used. I predict that the performer will mainly use the aerobic energy system because creatine is a finite source. Therefore, the performer will have to use the aerobic system. Another indicator of this is that exercise is submaximal and lasts a duration of 20 minutes. None of the other energy systems can sustain being used for that long. Because exercise is aerobic, this means that there is oxygen present, which binds with pyruvic acid and coenzyme A. This produces acetyl-CoA, which is carried over to the Krebs cycle. Heart rate during steady state exercise. Heart rate is the amount of time your heart beats a minute. What I believe will happen, heart rate will increase rapidly at the start of exercise, then it will plateau. Why will this happen? Initially, heart rate increases rapidly due to the proprioreceptors detecting the movement whilst the chemoreceptors will detect the lack of oxygen. A message is sent to the cardiac control center, also known as the CCC, in the medulla oblongata. A message is then sent down the parasympathetic nervous system to the SA node, where heart rate is increased. Then during steady state exercise, heart rate plateaus and stops increasing due to the amount of oxygen being delivered, meeting the demands of exercise. Therefore, no message will be sent from the chemoreceptors to the CCC and the heart rate will remain at the same level. Stroke volume during steady state exercise. Stroke volume is also known as the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart per beat. Initially, stroke volume increases due to the increased demand for O2. Stroke volume do, during the exercise will slowly increase due to the increase in venous return and intensity of exercise, also the demand of oxygen being met. This leads to the stroke volume plateauing. This statement is backed up by Jay Anderson, stating that the stroke volume may only increase up to 40 to 60% of maximum capacity, after which it plateaus. Beyond this relative exercise intensity, stroke volume remains unchanged right up until the point of exhaustion. Cardiac output. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped out of the heart a minute. Cardiac output increases rapidly at the start due to the demand for oxygen. Cardiac output will continue to increase very slowly due to the venous return and the intensity of exercise. And this means the demand for oxygen has been met, leading to the cardiac output beginning to plateau. As you can see, stroke volume and cardiac output do very similar things. Blood pressure during steady state exercise. Blood pressure is the amount of force applied to the walls of the blood vessels. Systolic blood pressure will initially increase due to the higher demand for O2. Diastolic will initially decrease due to the vasodilation of the muscles. Once the demands have been met, then both systolic and diastolic blood pressure will plateau. Blood flow and vascular shunt. Blood flow is the movement of blood through the body. Blood flow increases initially due to the vasodilation of the blood vessels that is stimulated because the demand for oxygen is high. Once the demand for oxygen has been met, the blood vessels will no longer vasodilate and will vasoconstrict slightly as less oxygen is needed once the correct internal diameter of the blood vessels is met. The blood flow allowed through them will reach a certain point and then will begin to plateau. Blood flow is also redirected away from the vital organs and towards the skin in exercise. Vascular shunt is the process of the redistribution of blood during exercise. On the end of capillaries and muscle tissues, there are pre-capillary sphincters. These pre-capillary sphincters can shut the blood vessels to non-vital organs during exercise, e.g. the bladder. The blood is then redistributed to the working muscles where the supply is needed. Thermoregulation is the process that allows your body to maintain its core temperature. Thermoregulation works by your internal temperatures changing and this being detected by sensors, also known as thermoreceptors, in your central nervous system. This sends a message to the hypothalamus, therefore at the start of exercise your internal temperatures rise. This is detected by your thermoreceptors and then a message is sent to the hypothalamus where a new signal is sent to the vital organs and blood vessels. This is where vasodilation can occur and this would start to cool down the body. 
At the start of exercise, I believe that temperature will begin to increase, and this will be detected by the thermoreceptors and cause vasodilation. As exercise continues, your body's blood vessels will have dilated, meaning that the body will be cooling itself down, and eventually you will reach a steady temperature. Venous return. Venous return refers to the flow of blood from the body back to the right atrium. Venous return during steady state exercise will increase at the start of exercise because more blood is required to be pumped around your body due to the demand for a sudden increase in levels of oxygen. If the athlete is working in the aerobic training zone, then the athlete will eventually get the heart rate and breathing rate high enough to deliver the needed amount of oxygen. At this point, venous return will plateau. Moving on to Starling's Law. Starling's Law is a rule that states that stroke volume will increase as the left ventricle volume increases due to stretching of the heart which causes a more forceful contraction, or put more simply, the greater the filling of the heart, the greater the amount pumped by the heart. Tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air breathed in and out in a normal breath. Tidal volume at the start of exercise will increase due to the demand in oxygen, also due to the stimulation of additional respiratory muscles, such as the sternocleidomastoid. These muscles can make the thoracic cavity larger, which will increase the ideal volume. However, once the tidal volume increases to a certain point where the thoracic cavity is not getting any larger and your body is receiving the appropriate amount of oxygen, therefore at this point the tidal volume will plateau. Breathing rate. Breathing rate is the number of breaths you take a minute. Breathing rate at the start of exercise increases due to the demand for oxygen at the working muscles. Therefore, the chemoreceptor send a message to the RCC, Respiratory Consult Control Centre, which will cause the increase in breathing rate. Breathing rate will rise to a level where the muscles are consistently receiving enough oxygen. At this point, breathing rate will stop increasing and will plateau. Effects of pH and temperature on the oxygen dissociation curve. During sport, temperature increases and there are higher levels of acid, therefore a lower pH. The carbon dioxide produced in the muscles and the hydrogen cause chemical reaction in the blood. This increases acidity. Therefore, there is a decrease in oxygen in the muscle tissues. There is an increased dissociation of oxygen from the blood. If you increase the temperature and pH, the curve will shift to the right. This is called right shift. If you decrease temperature and pH, the curve will move more to the left, left shift. Increased pliability of the muscles. Increased pliability of the muscles simply refers to the level of stretch that the muscles can experience. At the start of exercise, the muscles will begin to warm due to them being used. The heat will therefore make muscles more pliable, therefore at the start of exercise the muscles will become more pliable and allow more movement. Therefore this allows the muscles to stretch, however the muscles will reach a point where they can no longer stretch, therefore the pliability of the muscles will stop increasing. Muscle spindles and Golgi tendons. Muscle spindles are sensory receptors located within the skeletal muscles. They detect changes in the muscle length. This then con contributes to the fine motor control. They also play a large role in regulating the contraction of muscles. This happens because the muscle spindle activates motor neurons via the stretch reflex. This resists muscle stretch. When a muscle stretches, the muscle spindle then detects stretch and sends a message to the spinal cord where secondary sensors show the degree of stretch and then send this information to the CNS. At the CNS, a message is sent to the motor neuron to cause the contraction to occur and resist the stretch. A Golgi tendon detects the tension in the tendons when movement occurs. This these stop overextension occurring. 